Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, if you're a guest, my name is Matthew Johnson. I'm the lead pastor here at the Tree, and we're so honored you're with us this morning. And uh, we, we say it often, but we really do mean it. We want to connect to you. And so if you're willing, at the end of service, if you'll go across the comments to connection cent- or to a guest reception, uh, and just allow them to answer any questions you might have, to welcome you to our church, give you a gift, we would really appreciate that because it begins that process of connection, which is really important for us here at the Tree. All right, everyone do me a favor. If you have a Bible, electronic device, I'm going to tell you a passage of Scripture that I'm going to be at in about 20 minutes. It's Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, verse 21, so you can put a marker there, and then we're going to be there in a few moments. So we're in kind of toward the end of a series, and the series is, the title of the series is God. We're, We're simply looking at the nature of who God is, and the reason that we're doing it is this opening statement that we began this series with that we, I think we all understand, but it's this, that how you view God will determine how you relate to God. So on on a very simple level, if you have a negative view of God, you're going to be distant from God. And and for some, you have a negative view of God. Maybe it's because a Christian that you know acted a certain way and it was just kind of repulsive to you. Uh, Maybe you have an experience in a church that always taught you God was angry, that he's all about rules and regulations. And so you have a very distant, kind of a fear-based view of God. And so if, if you view God in that way, you'll be distant from God. Uh, If you have a favorable view of God, maybe you've had really good experiences, you've experienced his presence, and so you're drawn in, you're going to relate closer to God. But this series isn't simply about giving everyone a more favorable view of God, because here's here's the sad truth. There are people who have a very favorable view of God, but it's an incorrect view of God. There are people that think that God just supports them no matter what they do in their lives, that he is just their, their, their biggest fan, and whatever they do, it's okay as long as it makes them happy. And so they have a very favorable view of God unfortunately, it's inaccurate. And so the reality, and this is a very very blunt way to word it, is they're not actually worshiping God. They're worshiping their own created image of a God, and so it's really idolatry. So what we're trying to do in this series is to see who God really is based on how God has revealed himself to us in his word. We believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, and so as he speaks to us about himself, we can learn about his nature. And so our goal is to have a more accurate view of God, and then here's my personal conviction is that the better uh, view that you have of God in the sense of more accurate than that you will be drawn in deeper into his love because the more you understand who God is, the more you understand his love and he will draw you deeper and deeper into that relationship. And so we're looking at some, some principles that are very deep, uh, even complicated to understand because I, I think you guys know this if you're a part of our church, but my nature is I do like to teach. I really do have a strong conviction that the word of God is the foundation of our lives. And so I want you to understand difficult principles, theological principles, confusing principles. I wanna make them clear to you because I do believe it is something that you can build your life upon. So in week one, we talked about the reality that God is holy, that he's just simply different than us. When we hear the word holy, we, we have kind of the simple view of it in the sense of purity and something that is sacred and God is absolutely both of those. But when the Bible talks about holiness, it's actually talking about the transcendence of God, that he is just different. See, see for us, it's very easy to apply to God our limited view of the world because we have a limited view. We we are physical beings. We have a physical perspective, a limited perspective. And so it's very easy to project that upon God. If we look at a situation and it seems impossible, then we think it's impossible because that's our point of view. And so we sometimes put that onto God. But what transcendence of God or the holiness of God is talking about is that God is just different. He's other. He he is not like us. He is not limited by time or space. He's not limited by any of the hindrances that we have in our lives. He literally has all power. He has all wisdom. He has all knowledge. He is present everywhere. And scripture tells us something that should just absolutely soften our hearts is that God is also all loving and that God is love. And so we began just recognizing God is different than us. But that God who is different than us wants to be in relationship with us. And that's where we began this series. And it should have, I hope, softened our hearts and drawn us into into more authentic worship of who he is. Then in week two, we looked at a very difficult principle, the idea that God is a trinity, that God is one God. And scripture is absolutely clear on this. The, the, The motto that all of Israel would say over and over is, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. God is one, but he exists as three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And from our limited perspective, we think it has to be one or the other. Either he's three or he's one. And God goes, no, I'm one and I'm three persons. And and so we had a part where we just went, like, is it confusing? Yes. Is it true? Yes. Like, we just have to be comfortable with God is dynamic and he's different. But because what we're trying to look at is how do we relate to God, 
then the next question we had to look at, and this is where we were last week, is if God is three persons, how do we relate to God? And so last week we looked at God the Father. And God the Father, the ter term Father is a title he gave himself. And it's not simply that God the Father is the Father of God the Son, and we'll look at that today, but that he is our Father. And this is even how Jesus taught us to pray, that we would go to God and say, our Father in heaven. He wanted a father-child relationship. He wanted to be that, that intimate, close relationship where no matter what we do, he still has his love toward us and he's still working on our behalf to get us to trust him and to follow him. But what we looked at last week is that God, the Father, has consistently done four things. So first is that he created all. And all of God was a part of that process. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They created all, so all of humanity in, relation, in, in relationships. But the second thing that God did is that he immediately created a standard. And you need to know this because it gives us context for what we're looking at today. That God created a standard. And initially, it was one restrictive command and one proactive command. But then when humanity sinned and rejected him, as God created for himself a people group, the nation of Israel, he gave to them 613 laws, a, a, a huge set of laws that had some element were civic laws, how to operate as a nation. Some were moral laws like the Ten Commandments, determining what's right and what's wrong, and those are always true. And then he also gave them ceremonial laws. And these were the things that they could do that when they sinned, they could do these sacrifices to be put back in right relationship with God. So he gave them 613 commands. So he created a standard. And then the third thing is he said, I'm going to relate to you based on how you relate to the standard. And this is critical to understand. 613 laws, and he says, these are my commands to you. How you relate to these commands will determine how I relate to you. And then ultimately, the fourth thing that God the Father has promised to do is that every single person is going to have an eternal judgment based on how they related to that standard. And what we looked at last week, that was really good news, and I don't have time to recap the message, but those four things that can look very cold and, and isolating are actually very redemptive and good news from God the Father. But again, if you weren't here, just go online and watch that for free. But where we pick up today is we want to look at who God the Son is. And in order to understand who God the Son is, we have to see the transition. That God the Father set for us a standard. And humanity, for hundreds of years, struggled with that standard. There was not a single person who ever lived who actually met the standard of the laws or the standard of God. And so every single person sinned over and over. And so God, in his plan of redemption, then went to the next phase, the phase that changed everything. And that's what we're going to look at today. But as we begin to look at God the Son, it's important to understand who he is. And so what I want to do is I want to be very academic for, for some time, for about 10, 15 minutes. And then I want to spend a lot of time in what I would say is some rich application that I hope will soften our hearts and understand just the love of, of the Son has for us. But in order to understand, I, I want to answer three questions. I want to first answer who he is. Then I want to answer what he did. I want to answer why he did it. And then lastly, we'll just look at how that impacts how we relate to him. So who he is, what he did, and why he did it. And so the first thing is I want to look at who he is. So we go to scripture and what we see is that God the Son has been given many names. And I think it's important to look at the names because some of them can actually, in our culture, in our mindset, can give us the wrong idea. You see, sometimes what happens, and I think we all realize this, is that certain words have connotations. I don't want to insult your intelligence, but I'll explain what a connotation is. There's an actual definition of a word, but then those words sometimes have another image in our minds or creates a certain feeling or emotion, and that's a connotation, so it can be different than the actual definition. So I'll give you an example. I'm from Michigan. It, I always get booed, so I just like wait for it. It's like pause for booing. So I'm from Michigan, and so one of the things I realized is here in Ohio, that word has a negative connotation, <laughs> just the word Michigan. Uh, this is not an exaggeration. The first year that I lived here, I did not change my license over. I was having some issues with the title of my car and just some different things. And so I had a Michigan license, and I'm not exaggerating this at all. 100% of the time that I showed my license, or if I had like my credit card or whatever, and I showed my license, 100% of the time, the person responded, ew, you're from Michigan. I'll just tell you, if you're in Michigan and you show your Ohio license, they'll go, mm, you're from Ohio. Like, it does not register the same way. So that was a shock to me, okay? <laughs> so since I've lived here, I've had, and I'm not, again, not exaggerating this, I've had people come up to me and be very, very genuine, and they will say things like this. You know, I went to Michigan. It's actually a beautiful state. <laughs> and I was kind of looking like, yeah, like, why wouldn't it be? And it's because you don't like a football team. 
you, you do realize that makes you crazy, right? I mean, like, you get that. <laughs> Have you guys just accepted that and you own that? Are you comfortable with that? Okay. But so the word Michigan has a certain connotation that's negative. Okay. The reason I say that is the phrase that we have for God, God the Son, the word Son has a connotation. And for some, it creates the incorrect theology. And what I mean by that is when we hear the word Son, what we think is someone that is created. Because this is all we know. A man and a woman come together and they have a child. The child's a son. That child is created. That child is oftentimes inferior than adults. They're a child. There's adolescence. They're, they're, uh, they're subordinate to the parents. And so we have a mindset that it's childlike, that it's created, that it's less than. But when the scripture uses the phrase son, it's not talking about that in the terms that we understand. The term son means actually of the exact same essence of the father. So God, who has his essence, he is by nature God. It, it's who he is, a, a very blunt way to word it would be, that he is made up of godness. He is God. And this is what it's declaring, that his son is of the same essence. So I, Mary and I have four children. We have three boys and a, and a daughter. All of our children are, at the most basic level, they're, they're human. But they also have our DNA. We are, are of a family together. So if you do a DNA test, all of ours has some similarities to it. And this is what it's saying about God the Son. He is an identical, identical rep, uh, representative of God. He is of the same essence, God. But also the term son is talking about a position, the position of authority, a position of honor. He is the heir. And in that culture, they would have understood it that way, that he represents the father, that he is of the same nature of the father, that all things are entitled to him. So when we look at the scriptures and we see the son, it's not talking that God the son was created. He has always been. He is the same as God the Father, the same as God the Holy Spirit. We'll see today in scriptures that all things were created by him and for him. And so where we begin is to understand that God the Son is eternally God. He has no beginning point. He has always existed. Then the second term that is used for God the Son is Christ. You'll see often in scriptures it will say Jesus Christ. And for some, I'm not making fun of you, I'm really not. For some, you think that's his last name because you see it in scripture, Jesus Christ. But Christ is actually a term meaning the anointed one or the Messiah. In the Old Testament, the first half of our Bibles that were pointing toward Jesus, after humanity sinned, God the Father launched a plan of redemption. And part of his plan is he kept telling people that one day there would come the Messiah or the anointed one, the one that would come and restore Israel back into their right position in a relationship with God. Israel completely misunderstood this. Israel thought that the Messiah would come and be another King David. King David never lost in battle. He was never conquered by another nation. And so they thought he would be a military king that would come and restore them to a place of power and prominence and blessing. What they didn't realize, it was something much greater than that. That God the Father was sending the Messiah to restore them to a right relationship with God and that he would forgive them of their sins. But this term Messiah was one that all of the prophets talked about. That all of the scriptures were pointing toward the anointed one, the Christ that would come. So when Jesus came and he accepted that name where it says Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus, he was declaring to the world, I'm the one that has been prophesied about. I'm the one that came to save you. Another term that he was used to describe God the Son is the word. And the, well, what you understand is words are the best way to express our feelings and our emotions. Um, so like my wife, she's really good at communicating to me with nonverbals, right? <laughs> Anyone else have a spouse that's that way? Like, you guys are like, I'm not laughing at that joke. That's awkward, all right? Except for the dude right in the middle who had his hand super high. Is that you, Howard? All right. <laughs> but so my wife can communicate in nonverbals, but the best way that she communicates to me her emotions, her feelings, is through words. We get that. Words is the best representation. And God the Son was referred to as the Word. In 1 John, it described him as this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus came as the perfect reflection of the nature of God. He is the perfect example of God's wisdom, of God's nature, of God's glory. And so as we look at this, let's do a quick recap, is that God the Son, this position of authority, of the same essence God, who also is the Christ, the one who has come to save us, to redeem us from our brokenness and our sin. He is also the perfect reflection of who God is, his nature. But then the fourth term that is used to describe God the Son is actually the most popular word that's understood, understood in our world. It is the most popular name that is known in our world. Billions of people today on this planet 
worship this person in this name, and the name is Jesus. And Jesus was given as God, as God the Son became God the man, this was the name that was given to him. If you know the story, as God decided to become man and to take human form, he chose a, a woman, and I think even better, better said is that it was actually probably a young lady or a young girl. Uh, at that time, they married about the age of 13 and 14 and 15, uh, really just out of necessity because people died much younger. And so Mary, the mother of Jesus, was probably about 14 years old. And she received this prophetic word, and she met this angel, and the angel told her, you are going to give birth to the Son of God, even though she had never been sexually active. And so she became pregnant. But at this time, she was engaged to be married to a man by the name of Joseph. And Joseph knew that they had never been sexually active, but yet she was pregnant. And he seemed to be somewhat of an honorable man because he, he, he wasn't going to let the, the whole city know and have her put to death because of her sin. Instead, it said he was just going to quietly put her away and then just move on with his life. Like he would divorce her in the process of being betrothed. And yet this angel appeared to him and told him, no, this is what happened and explained it to him. But in the process of meeting with him, this is what the angel said. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so... God became man. God the Son became God the man. And in this moment, when this happened, it was a powerful moment because for the first time in human history, God took the form of his creation. And, and there's a theological term, you don't need to remember this, but it's important to understand the principle behind it. It's the hypostatic union. It is the joining of two separate natures. And in the first time ever, we have the human nature joined with the supernatural nature of God. And in this moment, he became fully God and fully man. And we need to understand this truth, because as Jesus came, he was not part one and part other. He was fully God, fully man. And this is just a simple, simply another example of the dynamics of who God is. You know, we, we look at him being eternal, we can't understand that. He never had a, a beginning point correct. And then we look at the fact that he has all power, but there's some things he can't do, and we go, like, how is that, how is that possible? And it's just, it's true about him. He can have all knowledge, but limit his knowledge. He can be present everywhere and choose not to be present. He can, he can simply not uh, be dependent upon time or space. He is three, and yet he is one. I mean, there's so many things that are dynamic about God, but as God the Son became God the man and the person of Jesus, in that moment, he was fully God and fully man. And as we look at how he was fully God, he was fully God in that he had always been God. There had never been a point that he wasn't God. Scripture would tell us that we'll see in just a moment that, actually you can put it up right now in John 1, 3, all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. The Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians, he said, for him, talking about Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He had always been God, and when Jesus was here on the earth, he did things only God could do. He forgave sins, and he wasn't simply saying, and God forgives you. At times, he would say, I forgive you. Your sins are forgiven. He had authority to operate outside of the laws of physics. He spoke, and the wind and the seas obeyed him. He walked on water. He multiplied food as if it was a normal, everyday thing feeding the thousands at times. He spoke and the sick became whole and the dead came back to life. He touched people and their sickness was removed from them. Things only God could do. So he was fully God. But then we also see in scripture that he was fully man. Jesus, when he was here on earth, was thirsty at times. He was hungry at times. He was tired at times. He felt emotions. He was tempted. Scripture tells us in all ways like us, he was tempted. He felt the same draw that we feel as people to do things that you're not supposed to do, and he wrestled with it, and he never gave in to it. Jesus ultimately was bruised, and he was beaten, and he bled. Just like all of us, he felt stress like us in the garden, and Jesus would ultimately give up his life, though God would raise him from the dead. And so he was fully God and fully man. But as we look at this truth that God was fully man, there's a part of it that we need to understand so that we can really have the context of the sacrifice that he made for us. So, see, here's what we know about Jesus. If you have a basic understanding of Christianity, you know the belief system. God became man and the person of Jesus. He lived a sinless life, and he died on the cross for our sins. He was resurrected, and then he ascended into heaven, okay? That's the basic story of who Jesus is. And if I were to say to us a question, 
What do you think is the most sacrificial thing that, that Jesus did, that God did? We would most often say, well, he died on the cross. That's the biggest sacrifice that he made. And I'm not taken away from that at all. That is absolutely the, the incredible sacrifice that he made. But there's more to it than simply saying he died on the cross. The, the greatest part of the sacrifice that God the Son made is that God became man, that he took the form of his creation, that he humbled himself. Many theologians were referred to as the condescension of God, that he lowered himself to the point where he took on the form of humanity. And, and even as I say it, it doesn't even register with us because it doesn't sound like a downgrade to us. If I say he took the form of humans, we're like, that's us. That's like, cool. You know, like, we're, we're humans. That's not a big deal. It doesn't, doesn't register. But Philippians says it this way. It says, have this in mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, so perfectly God, God form, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So he wasn't holding on to it and wrestling with it, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. As Paul is describing this, he's not simply saying the sacrifice of Jesus was the sacrifice on the cross. He's saying it was both the, the coming and becoming man and then also dying on the cross. Uh, 1 John 1, 4, or just John 1, 4 says, 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we look at this, and I'm going to try to help you understand just what a downgrade this was and why it was such a sacrifice. See, if I were to say to you, you have to take on a new form to save this other form. And I were to say, like, first, you have to take on the form of an animal. And I'm like, you know, my kids always ask me this. My, my kids are always like, Dad, if you could be any animal, what would it be? Like, I get asked that consistently. And I often answer, if I had to be any animal, obviously I want to be the king of the jungle, right? I mean... Anyone, can I get an amen on that one? You want to be a lion. No one else? Okay, a couple other people, yes. How many of you want to be birds? How many of you don't want to play this game anymore? Okay. And, and so if I said, you know, you have to save lions, you have to become a lion. Like, there's some cool things about that, but then there's like, it's still a downgrade, but it's not like super offensive. If I said, like, you need to become an elephant to save elephants, you're like, oh, okay, they seem like friendly animals and they're pretty loyal to the people around them. That's not bad. Or if I said a horse. But what if I started going down? And I said, okay, you have to become a dog. Like all you dog lovers are like, I would do it to save Poochie, right? <laughs> or a cat. But what if I was said to you, you have to become a rat. You have to become a mouse. You have to become a roach. What if I went even further? And I said, you have to become a virus. You have to become sickness. Or I were to say to you, you have to become cancer. This living destructive thing in order to save it from its destructiveness. Like, as you start to picture, you would say, okay, that's, that's obviously a downgrade, and that, that's just scratching the surface. For God to take on the form of his broken humanity was this ultimate sacrifice, but he did it so that we would understand just how great his love is for us. So he took on the form, he humbled himself and took on our form, all the way to the point of going to the cross and dying on the cross for our sins. So what God did, and I'll explain the why in just a moment, but what God did is that he came down from heaven, took the form of humanity. He lived a sinless life, never disobeying the standard that God set. He went to the cross as the atoning work, the sacrifice for our sins, so that we can be in a relationship with God. He died, was resurrected, conquering sin and death, and he ascended into heaven and sent his spirit to be a part of our lives. That's what God did. But I think many people actually will, will wonder, but why? Why did Jesus have to die? Why is this the system that God set up? So in order to understand that, we need to look at Romans chapter 3, the, the passage I asked you to turn to. In Romans chapter 3, verse 21, I, I want to kind of break this down thought by thought. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and what he declares, this is absolutely one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I teach it often. But he begins by just simply saying a phrase, and you need to understand the importance of this, of where he's leading, that the Apostle Paul goes, but now... And what he's about to declare is something that has never been true before. Something that has never been a reality before. So another way to word it is he's going to say, and everything has changed. So, but now something is brand new. And I would encourage you, if you're the type to write in your Bibles or highlight, to underline that passage so you understand what he's about to say is this revolutionary thing. And he goes on, he says, okay, so but now, he declares, the righteousness of God. What does righteousness mean? 
Have you, anyone say it out loud if you know it? Right standing with God. It's, it's something I often want you to say. I repeat it to the point of just kind of belaboring it because I want you to know. Righteousness means right standing with God. You are okay with God. God is okay with you. And he goes, but now, so the first time in human history, there's a right standing with God. But what's unique about it? He goes on and says, has been manifested or has been revealed apart from the law. This is the revolutionary moment. Up until this point, for thousands of years, it has all been about the law of God. The 613 laws, how you relate to the law determines how God relates to you. And for, for thousands of years, people were sinning and breaking that law over and over and having to make sacrifices on behalf of their sin. And, and Paul declares, okay, something has changed. And what has changed means that you're no longer going to determine your relationship with God based on what you do right or wrong. And again, this is revolutionary because no one had ever heard this. Not, a, not just in Christianity, in any religion. All the other false religions that worship fake gods, they still believe that the God was mad at them and they had to constantly do rules. And so what Paul is declaring is not just simply in Christianity or at that point Judaism as it was transitioning to Christianity. He was saying for the first time in human history and based on everyone's understanding of every single religion, here's what you need to know. There is an ability to be in a right relationship with God that has nothing to do with what you do right or wrong. And, and even as we hear that, there's a part of us that goes, Ah, uh, that just seems odd. You're telling me it doesn't matter what I do right or wrong? That's not exactly what I'm saying. Here's what you need to hear. It's absolutely based on right or wrong. It's not based on whether or not you do right or wrong. It's based on something different. Let, let me word it this way. Something new, not based on works, that will allow God to be in a relationship with man. This is what Paul is declaring. Something new, not based on works, that will allow God to be in relationship with man. And so what is it? He goes on in verse 21, apart from the law, he says, I want you to know this has always been the plan of God, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. From the very beginning, when God launched his plan of redemption, every single thing he did, speaking through the prophets, giving his law, all of it was foreshadowing. All of it was a type, it was imagery that was pointing toward what something would come later that would be greater. He says, so all of it was pointing toward it. And then he goes on in verse 22. The righteousness of God, the right standing with God, how do you receive it? Again, not based on right or wrong, not based on the law. He says, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. This is open and available to anybody and everybody, all who will believe, for there is no distinction. And just stop here. He says, this is how you receive it. It's no longer based on doing right or wrong because we don't do that. It's based on faith or trust in Jesus Christ. He, what, at this point, Jesus has already died, been resurrected, ascended into heaven. And he's saying, you have to have faith in him. Now, here's what we know. Will that faith lead you to do right? Yeah, absolutely. It is the faith that says to God, God, I believe you are who you say you are. Jesus, I believe you are God in the flesh. I believe that I need to be in a relationship with you. I believe I need to die to myself and surrender my life to you. I believe that the pathway you've laid out in front of me is the wise way to live, and so I'm going to walk in obedience. I trust you with all that I am. And God says, this is what it's about. It's not about right or wrong. That's been covered, and we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. But he says, it's about do you actually trust God? And I could even make the argument easily that this has always been the heart of God. Do you trust me? From the very beginning in the garden, don't eat of that tree. Why? Because I want you to trust me. As he gives them 613 laws, why do you need to obey these? Because you need to trust me, that I'm your God. And now he says, this is the relationship. It's based on faith in Christ Jesus. He goes on to say, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So who does this apply to? All of us. Do we deserve it? No. He's saying, no, we, we've all sinned. Literally, every person who has ever lived has broken the law of God. No one has ever qualified. No one has ever lived the standard perfectly. So this connects to every single one of us, this message. He goes, every person has sinned, but then here's the good news, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What Paul is talking about that God is offering to us, it's not based on what we do right or wrong, because if that's the case, it's something we deserve. And if it's something you deserve, that's called wages. But what he's saying is this is a gift. You don't deserve it. 
God has given us the ability to receive grace so that our lives can be transformed from the inside out, that we can be forgiven, the Spirit of God can come inside of us, and He can transform us. But it doesn't begin by doing enough right. It doesn't begin by stopping the wrong. It begins by just saying to God, in whatever condition you're in, as, as ugly as that can be, as, as broken as that can be, as hateful as that can be, in that condition, saying to God, God, I need you right now, I trust you. And in that moment of faith, you receive the gift from God, and he begins his work inside of you. And then he goes on and says, whom God put forward, and this gets some big words, we're gonna break it down, put forward as propitiation, by his blood, just remember that phrase, it's not one we commonly use, but I'll explain it in a moment. Propitiation by his blood, to be received by, say it out loud, by what? Faith, Faith. just note that, it's received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. And I wanna stop there, and I want us to understand what took place on the cross. If you can use your imagination with me for a moment, it actually works well that I'm on a stage, because it'll help you with the visual of it. But I want you to imagine that right next to me is the cross. And on the cross is Jesus being crucified. And so you, as people, represent humanity, and then God is up in heaven. In the moment where Jesus was on the cross, he was doing two separate things at the same time. One was downward and one was upward. The first thing that he was doing is he was downwardly providing redemption for mankind. He was taking our sin upon his sinless body and he was dying in our place. And he was doing that to redeem us. So in this moment, it was going down to humanity. It was this gift of grace covering all of our sins, dying for all of our sins. But in the same moment as he's on the cross, there was something else going on upward to God the Father. It's propitiation. He was satisfying the just nature of God because all of our sins deserved something. In Romans chapter six, it words it this way, that the wages of sin is death. All of our sin deserved death. And so we need to understand that God in heaven wasn't simply just ignoring our sin. That God in heaven wasn't like, okay, we tried plan A. It was, you know, I gave him a bunch of laws and, and rules and different things. That didn't work. So let's just go to plan B. Plan B is I don't really care about what you do right or wrong anymore. It's not a big deal. That's not what's going on. God in his perfect justice had to punish our sins. Our sins demanded death. And so what we understand is in our, in our culture and in our lives is that the guilty deserve to be punished. That's justice. If, if we see it in the news where someone commits a crime and they get caught and they go before a jury and or a judge and they're declared guilty and then they have a consequence to it, they sentence to time or whatever it might be, as we see that, we, we don't, like for us, we don't get upset by that. If the person is guilty and they, and they have punishment, we go, that's justice, that's how it should be. Matter of fact, I think in our culture, more often we get upset that the punishment's not harsh enough. That's when we, you see people protesting because that's injustice. When the guilty are, are justly punished, we celebrate that, that's justice. But when the innocent dies in the place of the guilty, willfully dies in the place of the guilty, that's grace, that's a gift. And that's what Jesus did, is he stepped in our place because God demanded that our sin be punished. God demanded that there be death because that's what sin always requires. And so when Jesus was on the cross, downward to us it was redemption, but upwards to God it was satisfying his requirements because God demanded it because he's a just God that cannot go against his own nature. And up until this point it said in his forbearance he had left our sins unpunished. And then it goes on and it describes it this way. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just. You need to understand this. This is really good news, and I'll explain why in a moment. God cannot be unjust. He had to punish his sins. He didn't have a choice. His nature is perfect. He cannot go against his nature. He doesn't want to go against his nature. It's what's perfect for all of us. And so the Apostle Paul goes, you know why he punished Jesus? Because he's just. He had to be just. And you know why that's good news? It's because if you ever think that you're so guilty that your sin can't be forgiven but you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, it would be unjust of God to hold your sin against you if you've already confessed it to Jesus. And so we know that our sin has always been forgiven. And so he says to this, not only to be just, and then here's the key, but he also wanted to be the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. He wanted to be both just and the justifier. What does this mean? 
I think this past week, we had one of the most powerful and beautiful physical examples of what this means. Uh, for you that follow current events, sometime in the past year or two, there was this tragic situation that took place in Dallas. Uh, this lady police officer was coming home, and she went into her apartment complex, and, and we still don't know exactly why, but she went to the wrong floor. She thought she was on her floor, but she went to the wrong floor. She goes and she opens up a door. She thinks it's to her own apartment. She opens it. There's a man in her apartment that's sitting there. What she thinks is her apartment. It's actually his apartment. She opens the door. She sees this man. She thinks he's an intruder. She pulls her service weapon. She shoots him and kills him. And obviously he's in his own home. On top of that, there was the racial dynamic. She was a white police officer. He was a black man. And, and you know the tension we felt in our country over that. And so this woman uh, went through the trial. And just this past week, she was convicted. And so a part of the process is she re they receive the verdict, she's convicted, then they also do sentencing. And at the sentencing, they invite people to come up and to speak on behalf of both the victim and then also the, the guilty party. And so different individuals got up. And this man who died, his name was Botham. And his brother gets up and shocks everyone because he doesn't tell anyone what he's going to say. Doesn't even tell his own family. And he gets up and he starts to speak and he starts to say things that nobody expected. He, he looks at this woman, and he's just staring at her. And, and the, the, the view that I saw was just, it was a camera focused on him, and he looks at her, and he says, I just want you to know I forgive you, and I don't wish evil upon you. I'm not going to come up here and say that I wish bad things would happen to you. And he goes, I don't, I haven't even talked to my family about this, but I want you to know I don't actually want you to even go to jail. I want you to live a life, and I want you to be happy. And he says, I love you. I love you as a person. And he said, if my brother was still alive, here's what he would want. And he, he first, before he even said that, he said to her, he goes, I forgive you, and if you ask God, God will forgive you too. And he says, if my brother was alive, here's what he would say to you. He would want you to give your heart to Jesus Christ. And then there's this, like I was watching it on, on my computer, and I was just amazed by it, just the beauty of this moment. But then he, he transitions and he asks a special request. And when he did, I'm sitting there in my office watching on my computer and I just started crying. He looks at the judge and he goes, I don't know if this is even appropriate, but can I give her a hug? And there's like silence in the courtroom. No one speaks, the judge doesn't answer. And I'm just guessing, the judge is thinking like, I don't even know if you're allowed to do this. Because what if it's even a trick and he wants to go over and assault her? I mean, like, who knows? And so, like, there's just silence. And he goes, she looks at the judge and he goes, can I go and hug her? And then, like, in this heartfelt moment, it almost just sounded like it was coming from inside of him. He just goes, like, he's choked up. And he just goes, please? Like, he, like he was desperate to hug her. And, he, and she goes, you can't. And he steps down from this place next to the judge and he starts to walk and the camera only has him in the shot and all of a sudden she comes running into the shot and she just throws her arms around him and she's sobbing and he's crying and he just holds her and it's just this beautiful moment. The victim, the family is saying to the guilty party, I forgive you, I love you, I want you to have the best life possible. And it's such a moving moment that the judge actually leaves her place on, on the, the stand and she comes down and she gives the woman a hug. And she's just declared that this woman's going to prison for 10 years. And, but she gives her a hug, and she gives her her own personal Bible because she heard the request of this young man who said that you should give your heart over to Jesus. And as I watched it, I thought, man, what a beautiful example of the grace of God that the victim says to the perpetrator, I forgive you. I love you. I want the best for you. And, and receives him into relationship and, and gives him a hug. And I thought, as beautiful as that is, and I'm not taking anything away from that, what God did for us was even greater than that. Because God was on the throne of, in, in judgment. And every single person who has ever lived, every single sin any of us have ever committed has always been committed against God. And so he is the only innocent party. He is the victim of every single one of us and every person who has ever lived. I want you to think about it. Every single sin any person in all of history has ever committed, it doesn't matter who they committed it against, it was also being committed against God. This holy, perfect, sacred God, righteous God, just God. And so in his position as, as the judge, he looked down at us and he had to declare us guilty. Guilty of our lust, guilty of our murder, guilty of our gossip, guilty of our adultery, guilty of every cruel and mean and selfish thing that we've ever done. And as a loving father, but still the judge, he looked down at us and he said, you're guilty and every single one of you are condemned to die. 
Your sin demands death. And this is what Paul is talking about. He had to be just. This is what God wanted. He wanted to be just. He wanted to, do, to, to declare us guilty. He wanted to sentence us to death, not because he was angry, but because what he wanted to also do next, that he wanted to be both just and the one who justifies. And so just like in this story, God declares us guilty, slams the gavel down, and then he steps up. He takes off his robe, and he steps down, and he says, I'm going to take your place. And so none of us had to go to the cross. None of us had to die because God took our place and this allowed him the special gift that he wanted to give us, this gift of grace, to be both just and the one who justifies. And do you know, this was always the plan of God. It was always what he desired to do. It was always what he wanted is to take our place. When we were at our worst, he still know, knew, I want to take their place. I want to show them love. Hundreds of years before Jesus came, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, and this is what he said. But he, prophesying about Jesus, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Hundreds of years before Jesus came, he knew exactly what he was going to do. So this is who Jesus is. It's what he did, and it's why he did it. So let's end with, so how should we respond to this? I think the only logical response is to say, yes, I'll receive that gift. As God looks at each one of us in our brokenness and in our sin, and he says, I want to redeem you. I want to change your life. I'm offering you a gift. The only logical response is yes. It's not to say, but, but you don't know what I've done. And God said, I know what you've done. I know what you've done more than you know what you've done. But my sin is great. No, no, no. The work of Jesus on the cross is greater. But I don't want to surrender my life. And he says, why? So that you can hold on to the brokenness of sin? That you can hold on to a pathway that leads to death and destruction? So that you can hurt yourself over and over and over again? Why? The loving Father says, accept my gift. Put your faith in me, surrender your life, and I will give you something greater than anything the world can offer. I will give you true life for eternity. This is the only proper response. So here's what I want to ask you. I want to ask you, is there anyone in this room that wants to do that? Is there anyone maybe that's never done that before? And, and I'm going to ask you to do something that's like terrifying. I'm going to ask you to stand up in a moment. And I've done this numerous times. I've been a pastor for 20 years, and I've got up and I've said it numerous times. And I remember, I remember how I felt when I did it as a kid. And I always share this story because I want you to know what you're feeling is normal. I was a kid at a concert, a Christian concert, and the, the speaker got up and, and gave the invitation. And I remember just sitting there thinking like, yeah, I, I want to be in a relationship with God. I want my own personal relationship with him. I need that. I want that. And he said, I'm going to have you stand up and come down to the front. And I remember being like, I don't want that, though. <laughs> I don't want to do that. And I remember my heart was beating. And I always tell our church this, like, it physically felt like my shirt was moving because I felt sick. My heart was beating so bad. And I was like, I don't want to know what my friends are going to say about me. I don't know what's going to happen. But I was just, I knew I wanted to respond. And, and I made that choice. I was nine years old. I made the choice to stand up. And obviously, it's made all the difference in my life. And so in the moment, I'm going to ask you to stand, and here's why. It's actually for you. It's not for me. It's not for us. It's for you to just have that moment where you say, you know what? Yeah, I'm willing to publicly declare, I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. And so if you're in this room, you know, I could say every head bowed, but you know what? You're going to be in a room of people that are going to cheer and celebrate. These aren't people that are going to judge you, right, church? These are people that are like, yeah, you should do this. So if you're in this room and you wanted to just give your life to Jesus Christ, maybe for the first time, maybe you've walked away and you wanted to be in a relationship with God, do me a favor right now, without hesitation, will you just stand? Anywhere in this room? Anyone want to stand? Yes, let's just celebrate, church. Yes, let's celebrate. People all over. Absolutely. Anybody else? Anybody else? So I'm going to, here, stay standing. I, I know this feels like the bait and switch. I don't mean it to be. We do me a favor. We come to the front if you're standing. I know you're like, oh, you jerk. Okay, but <laughs> come to the front just for a second. 
Here, here's what I want to do. We want to pray for you. Yeah, let's cheer them on as they come. Anybody else? Yeah, keep coming, keep coming. This is the greatest decision you've ever made in your life. It is the decision that will change the trajectory of your life. Jesus tells us that every single person, the broad path leads to destruction, and those who choose to follow him choose to walk on a pathway of life. But this isn't the end of the journey. This is the beginning. From this day forward, as you surrender your life to him, the Spirit of God has promised to be a part of your life, to meet you where you're at, to change you radically from the inside out, to, to just do incredible things in your life. And so for us, we, we know this. We've lived this out as a church, and we want to come around you and support you any way we can. So I want to take a moment and pray for you, and then I would just ask when you're done, if you'll go to uh, Connection Central, let them know. We're going to follow up with you this week and, and just continue to give the support that you need. But church, let's, let's extend our hands toward them, and all of you, if we'll pray. Jesus, we're so thankful that these men and women and children have responded to your call. We know you're the only one who saves. You're the only one who draws. And so they have felt your love. They have felt the truth of your word open up inside of them and connect to them and draw them in. And so I pray right now, as they experience their salvation, as you forgive them of their sins, we ask that your spirit will fill them, flood them so that they can experience the love and the power that comes from being in a relationship with the almighty God. And I pray that as they start to take steps forward, what will be in their mind and heart is to search, search out what your desire for their life is that they will change their perspective to want to follow your pathway of life. And even as you've said, the way that they receive this gift is through trusting in you. Help them trust you every single day of their lives, to trust you in the morning, to trust you in the afternoon, to trust you in the evening, to just walk in a relationship with you. And God, we are so excited. We know your word says that all of heaven right now is celebrating this moment, that when one person comes to salvation, the whole, all of heaven celebrates. And we as a church, we celebrate now too, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing. And God, we give you the glory for this moment. And we pray this in your precious name. Amen.